Trail and Ultra Runners, what is going on? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Coopcast. As always, I'm your humble host, Coach Jason Coop. And today's episode of the podcast is going to examine the value proposition of using poles in trail races. And I could think of no better guest for this than our upcoming guest, Nicola Giovanelli, PhD, who has become one of the most foremost experts in the use of polls and is pushing the research forward in this area. Nicola makes his second appearance on the podcast, and today he is here to discuss one of his more recent papers, which is titled, Pole Walking is Faster But Not Cheaper Than Uphill Walking. And as the name implies, they tested athletes in both a maximal and a sub-maximal condition with and without poles on a trail. Nicola is also a very good athlete in his own right, and we do veer off of the paper itself and speculate on why they got the conclusions that they did and what that might mean for athletes. At the end of this podcast, we also get into his soon to be released paper where they used an instrumented pole and instrumented shoes to determine if, in fact, poles do save legs. And I cannot wait for that paper to come out as well. Needless to say, you're going to want to use poles in your next race, particularly if that race is uphill and particularly if it is intense. So with that as a backdrop, I'm going to get right out of the way. Here is my conversation with Nicola Giovanelli, all about how to use poles to improve trail performance. Uh, Thanks for coming back on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope we can get to a couple of uh, papers that you've either written or are coming down the pipeline. But before we dive into it too quickly, man, like you've carved out your niche, so to speak, like in the research world and then the trail and ultra community as like the pole person. Like, you know (laughs) more about polling than I think anybody else out there. So the listeners can kind of like appreciate your background a little bit. Like how, like what started this obsession? Yeah, so yeah, maybe I, I'm quite good in knowing the pole uh, uh, science point of view, if we can say like this. And uh, because I have read a lot of papers about about it, and uh, with my group uh, we have uh, worked uh, a lot on on trails and uh, on trail running poles because you know there are many papers about Nordic working. Yeah. Um, but they are quite different uh, from our uh, technique because Nordic walking as uh, uh, usually they, u- they they use a, a diagonal stride, so it is more uh, specific gesture, and uh, uh, they do on flat terrain or uh, slightly uphill or downhill. But it is not real like in trail running. Uh, they also have. Uh, <coughs> Um, a specific aid for the for the poles, and uh, so we we should adapt the um, the results that these uh, authors um, found out and with uh, with with our trail running world. So um, the, everything was uh, born when uh, when we started to uh, try try to understand. Uh, um, if uh, poles were really useful during trail running, in particular during uphill, because um, looking at some races, in particular vertical kilometer races, of course, you can see that uh, in steepest races, uh, uh, the fastest athletes use the poles. Um, and but there were no uh, no no studies about uh, the uphill performance with poles. And uh, starting from the um, Nordic walking studi- studies, we, we thought that poles were useless because uh, in Nordic walking, uh, usually you have a greater um, energy consumption, uh, higher uh, heart rate frequency, heart rate, and uh, also higher lactate. And uh, so all these physiological parameters that were different when they use poles were like uh, not 
advantages for trail running. I mean, we, with training, we should um, we should decrease the, the energy cost. We should uh, decrease the heart rate at the same uh, uh, power output or, or, or um, running velocity, running speed. And uh, but these studies say that uh, if you use poles, you had higher heart rate and uh, higher uh, other parameters. So uh, we started to ask if uh, they were really useful. And uh, I tried to, 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 to read everything about poles, also in, uh, in cross-country skiing and ski mountaineering, but I couldn't find information and I couldn't find uh, real uh, data that uh, confirmed that poles should be used during uh, uh, uphill, um, let's say uphill running, even if it's not real running, because, you know, on, when it is so steep, you, yeah, you, can, you hiking. can run. <laughs> uphill hiking. hiking, yeah. It's like, uh, you know, there are some of my friends who kidding me, like saying that uh, I'm not a trail running, tra a trail runner, <laughs> but I'm a, <laughs> a trail walker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because yeah, you run down it, but uh, uphill you, usually you walk. So yeah, so, so this, yeah, so this, everything this, started from this. Yeah. So this whole thing started as an observation, and that that happens a lot in research where you're noticing a lot of the top trail runners are using poles, but we can't quite come up with a reason for why it's advantageous. And I think that this is particularly interesting because. When you look at all of the kind of parallel research, then you mentioned Nordic walking and also in cross country skiing, there might be some indication that poles could cause a disadvantage. So you have this discrepancy between athletes are using it in trail mountain running events because they feel that it's an advantage, but yet we didn't have anything concrete to say, yes, it actually is an advantage. And if anything, it might be a potential it might be a potential disadvantage. So thus the whole unraveling of things and starting to and starting to identify where polls might actually be an advantage. So we're going to talk about, you know, one of the papers that uh, that you uh, that you were the lead author on. And the title is is pole walking is faster, but not cheaper during steep yeah. uphill walking. And I, I like the fact that you had steep uphill walking very specifically identified and not and not quote unquote running. So <laughs> before we get into that though, like when you were setting this paper up, what was like the fundamental value proposition that you were trying to tease out with the research conditions? Um, so yeah. You are right about the 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 fact uh, uh, on the about the the cross country skiing using poles or no uh, or um, uh, Nordic walking uh, uh, disadvantage or advantage and uh, and the feeling that athletes uh, of trail running have when they when they use poles and uh, and also that th there were no concrete data about. Uh, using or not using poles and um, so we 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 when we talked about this paper the 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 reason why we did it was because we wanted to understand if they were useful to be uh, faster and uh, not like uh, not to be cheaper uh, to save energy let's say uh, because I mean, when we are, we are racing, we don't really care about the, the, the energy consumption. If the race is quite short, I, I don't, I mean, 20, 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, uh, even if the cost of transport is an important factor on, on, uh, on the performance and, uh, but what we measure, what we can measure is the, and, and what we, we want to improve and is the, 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 the speed, the vertical speed in this case. And so the final performance and to, to get a, a shorter time of, uh, to, to finish the, the trial. So, yeah, so the, the, the main idea here was just to measure the time performance uh, uh, on an appeal 
and then uh, to say, okay, um, we can be faster with poles or we can be faster without poles. So then, yeah, you know, I, I work in a, um, an exercise uh, physiology laboratory, so we can do a lot of measurements when we are doing these, uh, uh, these tests. So we put all together to try to understand why we were faster or, or, or slower when, when we used pause. So that's why we, we, we started this, uh, this paper. And uh, uh, that's the question that we tried to, um, to answer. And he, here's what I can appreciate about that the most is it's kind of like you're, you're going for the jugular, right? Because we all know that in, in athletics, especially when we're, especially when, when we're concerned about, okay, who's going to, what, what are the qualities that elicit a high quality performance, right? Or what are the physiological attributes that elicit a high quality performance? You're kind of going for the jugular right out of the get-go because you're measuring performance primarily at the end of the day. And then you can unravel all of the mechanisms. Is it a cost of transport thing? Is it a force thing? Are we somehow spreading out the load? And that's a, you know, another paper that you're, uh, that you're working on right now. But when I looked at this from the get go, I'm like, yeah, let's just get down to the heart of things. Let's put people in a time trial situation. Let's have them go uphill as hard as they can condition a condition B and see which one of those conditions produces the better performance. And then once we have the performance at the end of the day, then we can start to unravel what, okay, what are all the potential mechanisms that we can tease out that elicited this higher performance in this condition versus, versus this other condition. So that's what, that's one of the things that I appreciated uh, uh, about this, uh, about this the most. So you, you, exp you mentioned you worked in an exercise physiology lab, so you're able to kind of expand it from this initial idea of, we're just going to test in kind of these two conditions. So let's kind of go over the whole array of what you are actually okay. studying, and then we'll get into the results uh, of, of the paper. Uh, yeah, um, this study was, uh, uh, I think maybe it, it was my first re uh, ecological study. So the first uh, study on, on field. Uh, I mean, I have already published a couple of studies uh, on, uh, from the field, but it was like in track and field and uh, also it was like an easy setup, uh, experimental setup because it was just to go to the track and field uh, with the car, with, you, you, you get uh, all the stuff from the lab and uh, you, you took measurement there and then you analyze the data and, uh, and got the, the results. But this time was like, uh, you know, uh, to go to the mountain with all the equipment and uh, and uh, also a funny story is that I paced all the athletes uh, for four times um, up to the trail. So in one month, I, I think I did like, I don't know, 60,000 60, meters of elevation gain for, <laughs> for working. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I bombed sometimes and I was so tired at the end of the week that it was like real working and, uh, and, uh, um, and training uh, uh, at the same time. And so, yeah, it was super funny, but it was also hard. And uh, so this was the first, time that we we took some measurements on a trail or a yeah. mountain on a mountain trail because before we we had already um measured the pole walking and uh, the walking without poles appeal uh, but in laboratory conditions um in particular we built uh, we built um, a steep treadmill uh i think it was maybe five years ago um and we started to measure uh, the the um, two conditions, pole and without poles, uh, on steep incline up to forty degrees, but on treadmill. So you know, on treadmill, uh, um, the 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 surface is smooth. There are no stones or uh, uh, the the or uneven terrain. So. Um, we got some interesting results from that study too, because uh, 
we show that uh, with poles at steep inclines, uh, um, you can save some energy. Um, not a lot. It was like uh, four, three, four percent on average. Um, cheaper to work with poles uh, than uh, walking without poles. Uh, when uh, the the athletes were at uh, uh, twenty five, de- about twenty five degrees and or thirty degrees, and um, so um, from that study, we 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 thought that uh, yeah, with poles it was cheaper uh, to go uphill, and um, and so the idea was quite uh, uh, strong, and uh, we thought that. Yeah, we can go to do some measurements outdoors, but we were pretty sure to 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 find out the same results or similar results. Um, and uh, from that study, we also hypothesized that uh, the performance with poles should be um, better when when uh, when you are uphill on trail, uh, because if you can save energy, you can be faster. So. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was quite easy to understand this, this point. Um, but also we had some limitations to this first study on treadmill. And the first one was that it was a treadmill, so it was not so specific. And, um, the, the walking, the pole walking technique was completely different from, uh, the pole walking technique that you use when you go outdoors because on treadmill it is easy to do uh, to adopt a uh, um, diagonal stride like in cross country skiing. Um, but uh, when you are on trails, usually you you don't use diagonal strides so much. And because uh, you're you reacting more... to the terrain, right? You can't be yeah. as, as it can't be as patterned. I think is the way that most people will think about it. You can't have this like very monotonous, predictable type of pattern because you're reacting to the terrain. Yeah, you have to to adapt the the technique to the terrain and to the to the um, incline. So uh, we have seen that uh, usually on 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 mountain path they use more like. Double is not a real di- double yeah. polling, but it, it is a, a kind of in the middle between diagonal stride and double yeah. polling. So it is a different technique. And also, this is the reason why that um, pole walking um, in trail running is completely different than Nordic walking. Uh, in Nordic walking, uh, the, the movement is quite stable, but and in in uh, trail running is every every step is different yeah. from the others so uh, we we can't we can't say that okay if you do 1000 steps uh we yeah we have to average all the data because it is impossible to analyze yeah. every single step yeah. but um it is not like in order working so this was the first limitation the other one was that uh, uh when when we measure the for example the cost of transport on uh, on treadmill in in laboratory condition um we do like four five six minutes step um because we only need to have a steady state in uh, oxygen consumption and uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, production and uh, after five minutes, we stop the, the test and uh, we change the condition. For example, we change the incline and we do another yeah. one. Then after five minutes, we do another one. And But this is not so specific uh, to the trail running or vertical uh, kilometer races where uh, the duration is longer. And uh, so even the, the pacing can change. And uh, yeah. uh, so we wanted also to try to make more realistic uh, condition um, outside from the from the from the lab. Let me and, can, uh, can we can we yeah. pause really quick because I think that that's really important because what you were describing one of the limitations that you're describing is reflective of a, a very prototypical running economy test where we put an athlete on yeah. a treadmill at a at a at a predetermined speed seventeen kilometers an hour twelve kilometers an hour whatever it is. 
you get them to a steady state oxygen consumption and then you determine okay that's their running economy for that particular yeah. speed when we try and the reason that that's 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 particularly important is is it's something that's derived from the marathon and the half marathon world as a strong indicator of potential performance if you know somebody's running economy and you know their vo2 max you have a pretty good indication of what they're capable yeah. of in in, it, in, it, the, in the marathon world go ahead um you mean in uphill performance no no no, no not in uphill performance or, but in a in a flat level condition the and then the, and then the reason that that's that 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 is important is because the marathon is contested at a relatively monotonous intensity. The intensity yeah. does not vary all, all that much. And so when we take those types of protocols, and in this, yeah. in this case, it's a running economy protocol, yeah. and we try to adapt it into a different sport, vertical kilometer or mountain trail running, the results of it might not be as transferable and in this case one of the reasons that it potentially is and we're starting to tease this out a little bit more is because the event is contested at not a monotonous intensity certainly compared to the yeah. marathon and so when you're when you're mentioning the the sorry it's my dog shaking your head when i'm about to kick her out of my room by the way when you're mentioning um when you're when you're mentioning one of the limitations of the study it's that transfer of the yep. testing protocol to what it actually means in in in, in the real world and we got to start somewhere and we're starting from you know the marathon world and I, yeah. I think that you're starting to recognize that some of those transfers might not be as tightly correlated in trail yeah. in trail in trail performances yeah indeed there is a a, a discussion about um uh, about these uh, uh measurements about the, the the running economy you know because uh someone sustained that uh, it it is uh not so useful to measure for only four or five minutes and then assets go go running for two hours or more and uh sometimes a lot because, more yeah <laughs> two hours is quite good <laughs> actually and uh and uh, also we know that with fatigue uh, the running economy uh, tend to to be worse so you use more energy and you need more energy uh, than the beginning so when we calculate or we, we try to calculate the energy consumption in a marathon or even during a, a three running race um, we should consider that after one, two, three, four, ten hours, um, the the cost of transport is can be totally different from the yeah. beginning. Uh, yeah. Also, twenty percent. Even if we we have to 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 say that, uh, uh, and this is quite strange that some authors reported that after a sixty k uh, trail running race. Um, athletes had a uh, better uh, cost yeah. of transport, you know? Yeah. And there are more than one studies that uh, say this. So um, it is not clear. We, I mean, we know that cost of transport is, is one of the determinants uh, for the trail running performance and also for marathon performance. But it is not clear if uh, or why sometimes we measure an increase after uh, uh, a trail running race, and uh, sometimes we we find a decrease in cost of transport. So, yeah. um, I think, and also the, the fact is that uh, the differences that we measure, in particular when when we work uh, with uh, high level athletes, uh, the difference between different conditions, for example, using or not poles, or uh, uh, I don't know before and after a training protocol, the differences are so small. It's like, I don't know, two, 3%. Yeah. And uh, even sometimes they are not statistically different. So yeah. when you try to publish, uh, the, the reviewers say, okay, you the, the, the cost of transport is improved by 4%, but uh, it is not statistically different. So right. you can't say that yeah. it is better. Yeah. And I, I think from for for uh, 
uh, from a practical point of view, this is a limitation. Uh, it's like a gap between science and uh, and uh, field performance because if I, for example, with the poles on the on the Apple treadmill, we measured the difference that was like three percent or four percent, and uh, at some steps uh, it, it was not even different between using or not pause, but with pause the energy required was always lower, uh, maybe 2%. And uh, even if it was not statistically different, um, when we go outdoors and we try to do the, the, the performance with and without pause, a 2% of uh, uh, improvement in the performance, maybe it is a big difference. Um, you have maybe 10, yeah. 15 seconds better. And yeah, it's nothing for normal people, but for uh, high level athletes, it's the, 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 the difference between to be in top five or uh, to be in top 10 or to, to, to win the race. So, and it's different depending upon not only the athlete, but also the, the, the race itself. I mean, we, you know, we've got very good data from, University of Colorado and uh, Roger Crom's old old, old yep. lab that indicates that even small improvements, very small improvements, one percent, one and a half percent improvements in running economy or cost of transport can relate can translate to usually the ratio that they're that they've been using is about 0.7 to one. Yeah. So if you get a one percent improvement in running economy, that's going to translate to a 0.7 percent impro improvement in the actual race performance at the half marathon marathon uh, type of distance. We don't know what that means in a trail running situation. And I think that's something that we're kind of like continuing to unravel is if we improve these physiological variables, whatever it is, cost of transport, you know, when, with, with or tube, without yeah. poles, yeah. Uh, running economy in more of a traditional uh, in more of a traditional sense, if we improve those variables, do those, does that actually translate into an improvement in performance? But let, let's kind of get back to this study because I want the, I want the listeners to kind of appreciate how you initially set it up. First thing you did is you brought the athletes into your lab and they did essentially a graded exercise test, but uphill, which I thought was yeah. pretty, pretty novel and unique. You're trying to kind of like set a baseline. And then they went through four different conditions. Why don't you describe yeah. that, that process so, so we can put the listeners in the place of somebody who's actually participating in one of these tests and they can start to understand it. Uh, yeah, well, uh, you know, wh where I live, um, actually where I live, uh, it's uh, like a small community. Um, and uh, we know uh, everybody, each other. And uh, so I know, I think, all the athletes who, who compete in the, in the region. This is and, you cajoling uh, people into your lab. That's what you're trying to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, that's great. Because when I, when I have an idea about some study, I have like, I don't know, 40, 50 people that want to join the study. Because they want to try to measure themselves <laughs> on the lab, it's and selfish. they want they, yeah, it's yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so I, I have never had problems to find uh, uh, subjects for my studies, <laughs> and uh, also in the last two years um, I worked with a group from the University of Verona, and uh, when we decided to do uh, these two new studies, uh, they said, "Okay, yeah." We can try to do the, the measurements in our lab, but yeah, we can have maybe four to five people ready for the for the study. And I said, ah, no, maybe I can do it in, in our lab. And I have like 30, 40 people ready for the study. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, it's just to, to, to send an email or a message or a, uh, also an Instagram a story. And I get a lot of... Um, um, a lot of, um, to say, uh, availability from the athletes. And, uh, and th that is great because we can also um, make a decision uh, and we have inclusion, inclusion criteria for the study. So uh, maybe we need 17 or 18 athletes and we can get 20 to, to have a, a more um, a higher number. 
and also to have uh, the um, the choice if we have some problems, some issues with the equipment, for example, because you know when you do a lot of measurements, uh, the the um, maybe the lactact uh, w once it doesn't work or the VO two it is not correct or uh, so you have to to de to to delete some some data um, and if you have more uh, you you still have a, a high um, statistical power of the of the of that data so um, so you had 15 for this for this test right pretty yeah. pretty well pretty well powered here especially for an exercise yeah. physiology study i mean that's with one of our common plights is is to try to find enough subjects First thing you did was a graded exercise test uphill. Let's discuss that that condition, and then we can get into the yeah. four experimental conditions. So, what what does that actually look like? Like, what somebody comes into your lab, they're going to do this test. What are they going to experience? Yeah, they uh, well uh, at the beginning we we get um, uh, some information like you know um, how much you train, uh, how many times, and. Uh, um, what's your level now with you use the ETA points uh, performance index also to um, understand if they are uh, like elite or uh, sub elite or uh, uh, novel to, to trail running and um, and uh, and after this uh, usually we do the first test uh, uh, is the, the an incremental test to get the VO2 max and the maximum vertical velocity if it is an, an uphill test or the aerobic uh, velocity, maximum uh, aerobic velocity if it is a, a test on, on level. And um, after that, uh, uh, they, they also familiarize, familiarize with the um, steep treadmill because uh, one point is that uh, Probably the, the 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 most difficult part is to walking with poles on the treadmill. Yeah, and uh, so uh, usually they they walk for uh, several minutes on the treadmill, and if they live uh, near to the lab, uh, also they come more than one time um, to the lab for uh, trying and for maybe just for five minutes they go up and they walk with the poles at different inclines and. Uh, so this is very important because uh, we have seen uh, with the first study that there was, I think it was like one subject that uh, um, he didn't come to the lab before. And uh, when he started the test uh, uh, by walking with Paul, it was like super difficult to stay, uh, to balance yeah, uh, on, yeah, the, yeah. on the training. So um, that time we excluded that uh, that subject from the study. Um, and now we we give them the opportunity to come to try the old equipment more than once. And uh, and so, yeah. And uh, usually we for doing these uh, protocols, we need three to four days, testing days. But... Um, for the athletes, this is not a problem. I mean, uh, for them, it is like a training. And yeah, they are yeah. happy because they are doing training um, with all the data uh, uh, recorded. We, we, then we, we, gave, we give them uh, the data about the VO2, the cost of transport. And if we measure the force, we give them some data about the force. And so we... We try to give them something. So you bring the people into the lab for the first time, yeah. right? And they're gonna they're doing a maximal they're they're yeah. doing a, a maximal graded exercise test. You yeah. start them out at a slope of ten degrees or ten percent slope, right? Yeah, at yeah, five k an hour, and yeah. they every minute it increases two percent, yeah, until you get to a slope of twenty four percent. Yeah. And then the speed increases until volitional exhaustion, until volitional exhaustion. So it's a yeah. hard test, right? So you're establishing yeah. their maximum. What are you, what are you drawing out from the athletes for that particular maximum part of this graded exercise test? Yeah, we use this test for, uh, uh, two main reasons. Uh, the first one is to get information about the physiological parameters, uh, the VO2 max in particular and the, the vertical velocity. And the other one is to get the uh, second ventilatory threshold. Um, 
because we use the, that uh, intensity that is called also an aerobic threshold. So we, we have we have many, um, uh, how to say, we can call it in in different way. And you're uh, determining a threshold of sorts, yeah, right? I think that I think we yeah. can simplify it for that. Yeah. Yeah. And from this intensity, we set up the the next test on the, uh, for example, on the treadmill or uh, uh, in this case, not for uh, we didn't use it for the outdoor test because in the outdoor test we we did another maximum test to get the eighty percent of the vertical velocity uh, to use for the sub maximal test. So the incremental test uh, uh, was necessary to get the, all the data about the, the, the subject. So we know the athletes, we know everything from the athlete, the maximal lactate uh, concentration, uh, the VO2, the vertical velocity, and uh, what is the heart rate and uh, for, 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 for the maximum and also uh, at the threshold intensity. Yeah. And so you're now taking the, that kind of like lab data and using it to calibrate the four field trials that that you then had the athletes undertake. Can you describe like the four conditions that the athletes had to kind of go through when you actually took them outside? So you did the first thing. It's inside. Yeah. It's in the lab. It's in a controlled environment. Now let's move this to the outside. And what are you specifically measuring under what conditions? Yeah. First thing is that... Uh, when we do um, outside test, we have to, to check the, uh, we, we can't calibrate the temperature or the humidity, yeah. Yeah. but uh, we try to, to have similar conditions. I mean, if one day it is not raining because we can't get the, the measurements when it's raining, but if it was super humid, we didn't do the test. Or if it was, uh, I don't know, yeah. Uh, yeah. super hot, we didn't do the test. Yeah. Or we do, we did a test in the morning uh, one day and also the morning the other day. So we try to maintain the same uh, the same time uh, during the four conditions. And um, when we moved from the lab to, to outdoors, the first things it was to do uh, two maximum tests on a trail of uh, um, four hundred meters of elevation gain. Um, in uh, 1.2 or 1.3 kilometer. So um, it was uh, the, 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 the average incline, it was about 20 degrees and the maximum was like 30 degrees. And um, so they, they did two maximum tests, one day with pause and one day without pause. Uh, and this was randomized between athletes, of course. Yeah. And uh, we measured uh, the same parameters that we got in the lab. So they did the test with the um, um, metabolic unit with the mask. Uh, they use, uh, we, we, we get the blood lactate concentration at the end of the test. And um, so we get the heart rate, the VO2, the VCO2. And, uh, and also the rate of uh, perceived uh, exertion at the end of the of the of each day and um, and of course we measure the the time so they started for example one the first day the athlete started without pause uh, to try to do uh, his best uh, on this uh, on this uh, trade and um, afterwards we we get all the data and uh, we calculate the metabolic power and uh, we measure the lactate and everything. And the uh, second day, we did the same trail in the same condition uh, or similar condition, but uh, without uh, one day with pulse and one day without pulse. So after, after this, we, 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 we compared the first thing was comparing the time. And, uh, and uh, because it was... Uh, uh, the performance. So we were interested in improving the performance. So first things was to compare the time with pause and without pause. And we calculated the vertical, the average vertical velocity uh, of each day. 
And from this, we calculate the 80% of the vertical velocity. For example, um, if one athlete uh, uh, run the trial or better walk the trial uh, at uh, uh, 2000 meters uh, per hour of uh, elevation gain, um, we calculate the 80%. So it was 1,600 meters per hour. And we use this uh, vertical speed, vertical velocity for the next test, for the next two submaximal tests. This is what I found interesting, but hold on before we get, before we yeah. get into that. So just to recap, you had the athletes do two maximum effort time trials up a trail. Yeah. And just to like help the listeners encapsulate that this is about a 20 minute effort, maybe a little bit less than a 20 minute effort, as yeah. hard as you can go with poles and without poles in a randomized order, right? So you get them there. They don't yeah. know if they're going to do with poles or without poles that you tell them you're going to do with poles and the next day without poles. And you're comparing the time and you're also collecting, you're doing, you're also uh, collecting the uh, uh, their oxygen uptake or their oxygen consumption, as well as you're taking lactate uh, at the very end. You then yeah. take those performances. Well, first off, what did you find in the maximum tests? We'll just stop there and then we'll kind of go to the submax test, which you're alluding to. What did you find within the maximum tests in this, in this hard, go as hard as you can type of time trial? Yeah, I, I think this is the the, the most important um, uh, results of the study, and it was that uh, twelve out of uh, fifteen athletes were faster with poles, and uh, they were like thirty seconds uh, faster with poles um, on a on, on an eighteen uh, or nineteen minute effort. Yeah, which is, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah which is not lot. which is not trivial. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was like uh, uh, only uh, 2.5 or 2.6 faster percent faster. So this is what we, we were talking about uh, before. And um, so I think this is important because we can now we can really say that uh, pause are useful to inc improve the performance. In that um, condition, in that maximum, this, go yeah. as hard as you can for 20 minute type of type, yeah. not exact, but type of condition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, and uh, the three athletes that didn't improve the performance, we try to uh, to understand why. And uh, I'm pretty sure that two of them uh, didn't um, were fa uh, they they weren't faster with pause because they were uh, too strong uh, as athletes. I mean, they, uh, they had a VO2 close to 80 milliliter per kilo per minute. And uh, they were so fast on this, on this uh, trial, maximum trial, that uh, the average velocity uh, was faster than the walk run transition. So they 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 run almost all the trail up, uh, and they run with the pause. So when we yeah. when, when they didn't have pause, they could uh, uh, be faster than when they didn't than when when they ha had pause. So uh, probably for them, uh, this was the reason. Hmm. It's interesting because you present all the individual data in the paper. Yeah. I'm looking at it right now. It's this is figure two. If people are just kind of like following along and you can see those two athletes that have a, you know, a vertical uh, velocity of somewhere around 1750 meters per hour, which that's really fast. Yeah. Um, that's a, that, that, that's very, very fast. And that's a good observation from your part that they're not, that those athletes are not actually walking, they're running uh, yeah. the, the, the entire, the entirety of the trail. So in, interesting observation there, but almost everybody was faster using poles than yeah. not using poles. What say you about the metabolic data, the oxygen consumption? Was that different between using poles and not using poles? And what do you read into that? Yeah, the interesting thing is that uh, we we didn't find um, differences between uh, using or not using poles in any of the uh, physiological parameters, not in VO2 or 
cost of transport or art rate or lactate uh, concentration or uh, um, RPE or uh, whatever. Uh, also in the in the um, step length and step frequency, everything was the same. So you use the same energy, but you are faster. That's the message. Yeah, which is really so. Here's kind of what I take take away from that, and I think that this is a little bit maybe surprising, right? Given some of the previous research, yeah. But kind of, kind of when I look at it, and I want to get your opinion on this. When you're going as hard as you can, it's as hard as you can, and there's there's like if you're doing a VO two max type of effort, which 20 minutes is going to be pretty pretty freaking close to that. It's kind of hard to change that despite the conditions, poles, no poles. You can try to contrive it in any kind of other way. But because you're going so hard and you're already eliciting a maximum, a, like a maximum type of cardiovascular or cardiopulmonary type of effort, when you change the, when you, when you kind of change some piece of it and here you're changing the equipment, it's not surprising to me that the VO2 data is exactly the same because of that, that condition that you're just going all out. Yeah. And this is the reason why that we can say that they perform, uh, as their best in both conditions. Yeah. So this is important for us because if, uh, the VO2 or the art rate or the cost of transport was different between conditions, uh, we couldn't really say that they were pushing uh, their best in both conditions. Mm -hmm. So uh, at their maximum, it is maximum stop. So it is not like yeah. I can give, uh, I can go faster or I can uh, have a higher VO2 because I have pulse. Yeah. Uh, maybe we could expect some difference between, between using or not pulse be because uh, you know, with poles, you use, uh, you involve more muscle mass and, uh, and the heart rate might be a bit higher, but probably all these subjects were so were trained with and without poles. So they could push, uh, at their best in the, in, in both conditions. And, uh, yeah, so this is uh, quite important to us, uh, uh, to, to say this. And the a different um, a different uh, uh, discussion is about the submaximal um, yeah. uh, trial. So let's do that. Parameters. Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. do that. So you get your maximum trials, and the the take home message there is they can go faster at the same oxygen cost. Yeah, and then you bring them down into a submaximal condition. So describe, like, try to describe how hard relatively speaking that submaximal condition was for the athletes how you're instructing them on how to do it and then what the results were yeah so from the vertical velocity of the maximum test we calculate this uh, 80 percent and uh, we use this uh, uh, intensity to set the the next two tests one day with pause and one day without pause at 80 percent of the vertical velocity maintained during the the, um, the maximum test um we decide to use this uh, um, percentage because it is quite similar to the intensity that it is maintained during a six hour trail running race mm, okay uh, that's important right you, you yeah. like that's a reasonable length kind of like ultra marathon six hours yeah. let's see what it looks like at this type of intensity yeah, and we were interested in 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 try to measure this uh, intensity because, uh, okay, we we have, have seen that when you are doing a, a maximum test, poles are important and you can uh, be faster. But uh, we also are interested in understanding if in longer um, performance they can be useful. Uh, why? In UTMB or in any other long uh, three running races, you see maybe, I don't know, 99% of, uh, of particip participants that uh, are using pulse. And, uh, but there are no data that about this. So yeah. uh, we, we didn't know why. Yeah, I mean, 
I'm an athlete too, and I use poles in long, uh, in long performance. And uh, I feel that I can do better with poles. Or, and uh, the fatigue is uh, lower and the uh, uh, perceive exertion is lower. But we didn't know, we didn't, uh, we couldn't have a, um, a number that said, okay, it is much better and uh, you can save 5% or 10% of energy when you, when you use post during uh, UTMB. And so uh, we tried to, to, to measure the, um, the cost of transport, so and the oxygen uptake um, at the same intensity that usually athletes use uh, during a six to seven hours um, race. Uh, for this reason, we, we use this intensity and, uh, and the athletes try to do the same uh, uh, 400 meters of elevation gain uh, in both conditions with and without pause. At the same, uh, with the same time, I mean, if one athlete had to, 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 to complete the trial in 22 minutes and 30 seconds uh, with pause, the day, the, the day, um, the second day, he did the same 400 meters at the same vertical velocity. So, uh, 22 minutes and 30 seconds. But and here's hold on, hold on. It's kind of clever how you did it, though, and I want people to appre- I want people to appreciate this. So you're you're telling them to do this time trial at eighty yeah. percent of the vertical ascent rate that they did the maximum trial is, and that's like like if 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 everybody at home just think about this proposition, you go out and you run up your favorite trail as hard as you can. And then the next day, you're going to run up that trail at 80% of whatever that maximum, whatever that maximum is, or whatever the ascent rate was for that. That's not an easy thing to do. So you actually employed a pacer to kind of like <laughs> set the right tempo on this, correct? I mean, that's what I'm reading in yeah. the paper. You had somebody say, okay, I'm going to like, I'm going to make sure that all these athletes hit this 80% mark correctly. And then the pacer, it was the pacer's job to make sure yeah. that they were on pace. <laughs> yeah, and I did it. <laughs> I was about to say, this is you. This is where you get the 60,000 meters of vertical. Yeah. Right? You were the pace you were sacrificing yourself for science at this point. <laughs> yeah, of course. You, you know, uh, some some days I did it four. Uh, I, I think maybe one day I did it five times. So it was like uh, 2,000 meters of elevation gain. Uh, up and down, up and down for all day. Okay. And I figured it was you when I read that in the paper. I'm like, <laughs> I know, I, but I wanted to get confirmation on it. So you are the pacer. You're yeah. ensuring everybody runs at 80% of their, of their ascent rate for this, for this second set of trials with poles and without poles. Yeah. And you did a pretty good job at it. Just looking at the <laughs> statistics, to be honest with you. I mean, they're very, very <laughs> consistent. So, yeah, but- so go, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, because we, we mark the, the trail every 25 meters of elevation gain. So I, I, I calculated the time to get uh, the first 25 meters, then the 50, then 75, then 100, 125, and so on. And uh, so I knew that if I, I had to, to go up uh, I, 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 uh, the, the first 25 minutes, 25 meters in one minute, then the 50 was two, two minutes. So I just <laughs> go in front of the, of the participant and, uh, I said, okay, just follow me and, uh, walk with pause or without pause and just follow me. And every, uh, every 100 meters or so I asked them, uh, the, the Borg scale for the mm. perceived exertion. So um, yeah, and it was quite easy with the slower uh, athletes, but with the two <laughs> fastest, it was like yeah, I was full gas <laughs> in yeah, front yeah, of yeah. them. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, it was great training for me. Okay. <laughs> by the way, so, so now now you've got this set up to where you have these fifteen participants. They're walking uphill with poles and without poles at an effort that's equivalent to about a six hour, you know, about a six hour about a six hour race. What did you find from those two trials? Um, we we found what we didn't think to find. I mean that uh, 
uh, based on our previous uh, papers, we thought to find um, a lower uh, cost of transport, lower uh, art rate when they used POS. Um, but uh, at the end, uh, it was uh, everything, every, every physiological parameter was the same in both conditions. So there were no differences between using or not using POS uh, at this intensity. So, yeah, so the message was not clear. I mean, uh, we cannot say that uh, poles are useful during uh, uh, a long race. And, uh, but yeah, we cannot say that uh, they are useless as well. I mean, uh, we, we didn't find differences between the two conditions. And one reason probably was, uh, because you know they they started and they did this trial uh, not in fatigue conditions, so for them to go up at eighty uh, percent of the vertical velocity of the maximum test, it was like a medium intensity because um, it was like seventy uh, percent of the of the uh, maximum heart rate, so it was quite easy to maintain. And uh, and uh, we do we did only these measurements when they were not fatigued. Yeah. If if we tried to do the the same measurements maybe after six hours of uh, trail running and after maybe two thousand meters of elevation gain and loss, maybe we 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 had uh, uh, some different uh, um, results because. Uh, uh, with uh, your when your legs are fatigued, probably you use more your upper limbs uh, for pushing on the on the poles, and uh, so yeah, this is a limitation of this part of the study. Um, you can and, only compare uh, what you measured, right? So I'll, yeah. I'll add I'll add I'll add a caveat or a postscript to your earlier comment that you can't create a compelling reason to use poles in this condition based off of what you were measuring and the specific yeah. thing that you're measuring oxygen consumption lactate you know heart rate and things like that yeah which are remarkably identical if anybody wants to go look at the p values on the paper like those 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 values are remarkably identical across those conditions you hardly ever see that uh or at least that level of consistency or that level of reproducibility in uh, uh, in exercise physiology research because everybody's so different. So, so it is remarkable that you actually found that. However, as you mentioned, there might be another benefit to using poles in a similar intensity condition, six hour race, eight hour race, you know, however you wanna, however you wanna call it because you're not measuring for everything, right? You're, on, you're only, yeah. only quote unquote measuring the kind of the cardiopulmonary uh, aspects of things. So let's get into that. And I, I appreciate you sending me over kind of the pre-production of yep. uh, what's going to be a really cool paper when it actually does come out. One where you used instrumentation to start to, start to solve this problem, which is really cool. You used instrumentation at the level of the foot and you use instrumentation at the level of the pole to determine yeah. is there some sort of savings or advantage advantages can you kind of describe that a little bit to how you're starting to uncover okay now that we can't create like an economy case essentially or cost of transport case for using poles or it's difficult to what are the other advantages that you're actually looking at now yeah you know so after this uh this study we we wanted to understand why uh athletes were faster we know that uh, with poles you can uh, redistribute your the, the the work from the lower limbs to upper limbs, but we didn't know how much work you can do with your upper limbs um, during uh, uphill walking. So we used uh, um, we used uh, an instrumented poles and also the insoles. Uh, to measure the the force, uh, the pushing force on the pole, and uh, and the ground reaction force on the on the feet. Um, what is that? It, before you get into it, like yeah. like what is an instrumented insole and an instrumented pole? You said you're measuring the force, but is it like 
like I, I understand the souls because I know the technology, yeah. the, the listeners are not going to be familiar with this. So we can describe that, but I don't know how you did with the poles. So I'm more curious. So describe both of those, like the, the insole that you're using and the instrumented poles a little bit. More. Yeah. So we, 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 we put a cell force, a small one uh, in the, in the pole. And um, so when, when you push on the pole, you can, you can see, um, from the device that uh, that uh, we built, you can see how much weight you put on the pole. I mean, if you uh, if you push one kilos or uh, uh, ten kilos or uh, twenty kilos, we could see uh, how much weight in newton we got from the from every uh, every movement uh, uh, from the poles. But it's a, and, it's a strain gauge similar to like a cycling power uh, meter. Am I understanding that correctly, or is it slightly uh, different? Yeah, it's not string gauge. It's a, um, a button cell force. Uh, it is a small one. It is like uh, I don't know, like a button. You know, this is the, the button, and uh, um, it has a small, uh, a small uh, um, um, part that when it is pressed. May, uh, change the the voltage of the of the cell of the right. of the force cell, and then from that uh, with the calibration we can get the the real uh, data about the force the 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 force the newton or the kilo kilograms. Okay. And uh, a similar is the the insoles. Uh, we use the the um, an insole with uh, uh, they were three sensors two in the f- four foot and one uh in the rear foot uh but then we average all, all the sensor because we didn't want to 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 look for if you you push more with the four foot or rear yeah, foot yeah. and um so then we we get all the data together and we compare the data from the poles with the data from the uh, feet and uh, we try to understand uh, uh, to get the the, the results for, of the using poles and to to look for uh, if wh- when you use poles uh, you can use less your uh, lower limbs. So I, I don't know if you, but in Italy we say uh, that when you use poles you save your legs. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. uh, that's a very mean, colloquial way to put it yeah yeah and we mean that uh, uh if you use poles you need less force uh from your uh, lower limbs so we we wanted to to see if it was real and uh so we did a similar protocol of the first study um the athletes did a maximum test two maximum tests but it was quite. It was a bit short. It was only one hundred and fifty um, meters of elevation gain. So it was like uh, five to test. seven. Yeah, very short yeah test. it was a short test, and um, uh, one day with and one day without without pause. And we also did the same in treadmill. So we did two incremental tests um, to maximum. Um, by increasing the, the the slope of the treadmill every every minute, and um, one day it was with pause, and one day it was without pause. So um, the the results of the study we are now discussing also with the reviewers because um, we are trying to publish this uh, uh, on a good journal and. Uh, uh, I think it is quite interesting because it is the first time that uh, it is we compare the force from the upper limbs to the lower limbs yeah. uh, during a trail running uh, uh, event, and um, at the end we can say that when we use poles, we need uh, less force from the lower limbs, and uh, this is important because. Uh, for long, for long uh, uh, event, you can save uh, even if it is like only two, three percent uh, of energy saving. It's a lot after ten hours of trail running. So, um, I, I think this is a good, uh, a good uh, um, device to measure this uh, different. And uh, 
we can we, we are also working more on this with these devices and i tell you more uh, that we are we have just finished another, another measurement another study uh, in which we measure the uh, polling force uh, before and also the cost of transport before and after uh, 30 30 k uh, tray running uh, training and it's almost uh, like a durability study right yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, yeah so we have a lot of data to publish to date and uh, so we have to 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 make more clear this some points of this discussion and uh, yeah but what so let me try to encapsulate this for the listeners uh who might have gotten lost in the weeds of you know force and the physics lesson and things like that literally you're measuring how hard the athletes are pushing off just with their feet and then yeah. how hard they are pushing off with the poles and then comparing those two conditions and saying well are they pushing off as hard with their poles as the difference between how hard they're pushing off with their feet when they actually use the poles like is it if is it is using poles uh i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna use a kind of a colloquial terminology here but is the use of poles an efficient system or do you yeah. have to put more force into the ground than you're actually alleviating from your feet more force in the ground with your arms than you're actually alleviating from your 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 lower limbs and that's an unanswered question and one that we try to use the metabolic data or the cost of transport data to try to like use a little bit of a window into that but you're actually yeah. getting the force data literally at the level of the at the level of the pole level of foot almost at the ground level right to use that term to to try to answer that which i think is really interesting and and to be honest with you once a lot of this comes out i think that it's going to either add clarity and or change how we use poles in a real-time setting do we use them in steeper terrain do we use them on more flat terrain do we use them at this intensity versus that intensity because you start to get to the well i like to use them because i feel better and i feel like i'm faster but we yeah. but, but since there are all these varying conditions uphill steep uphill you know going slow walking running as you mentioned in the earlier trials yeah. we don't have a good set of like operating rules to say under these conditions, these are the specific types of performance or the, the specific ways that it can improve performance. And under these conditions, it actually might be a detriment. I can see that starting to get teased out with the with this and the future iterations of research that, that, that you're producing. Yeah, um, we uh, from the from the results that we have uh, to date, we can we can say that uh, um, steeper is the is the, the the slope and greater is the um, advantage that you get from the poles and the faster you you or better higher is the intensity and uh, greater is the advantage you get from the poles so uh, now the point that is missing is um, if uh, during ultra long races, ultra long uh, ultra trail, you really can get uh, uh, a lower um, cost of transport, and you if you can have uh, um, if you can save energy from the using from using poles. So here's the thing uh, with that, though, man. Here's the thing that, that with not to cut you off too quick, but here's the thing that 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 would be really interesting to me we know in really long races oxygen is not as much of a premium or the rate of oxygen consumption is not really at a premium you're running at your your locomoting at such a low intensity that even if the cost of transport were two or three percent higher or something like that using poles over 100 yeah. kilometers let's say let's say your energy cost went up by two percent I'd kind of look at that and go, you know what? That's not that big of a deal. For most athletes that aren't like pinning themselves on every single climb, if they can get a saving to your research that we just pointed out with the instrumented poles, if they can get a saving of the legs, right? Yeah. In some other format. So that's what I'm saying. It's starting to tease out the like kind of the nuance of it is 
is it a cost of transport or an oxygen saving or it, is it actually like a a force or a muscular right type type of saving and 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 the strategy to which we kind of like deploy poles i think is going to change because be, once we start to figure out better answers to that yeah i i think that uh Without looking at the physiological parameters like VO2 or cost of transport, we just can say that uh, when when you use poles and uh, when athletes that participated in our studies uh, use poles, they always add lower rate of perceived ex exertion. Yeah. So it, it is probably more muscular. Uh, I mean. Uh, when in the last study, in the force studies one, we 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 have seen that when uh, you use pose, you have uh, lower weight on your feet. You have to push less uh, to go at the same uh, at the same uh, vertical velocity, and uh, so this redistribution of the work between lower and upper limbs can help. Uh, maybe not to be faster. Uh, but uh, the feeling that you have uh, is much better, and uh, probably you can also. I, I, you don't save energy. You you use the same yeah. energy, but the, the the same energy is distributed from the upper to and lower limbs, and so maybe nothing changes from a physiological point of view. But uh, the the big change is that you feel better, and maybe. Uh, then you can run faster down here because yeah. because your muscles of the lower limbs are uh, not fa fatigued. And then uh, the difference, maybe you don't do the difference uh, during uphill, but you can be faster downhill or in the runnable sections of the race. And uh, also this is a, a point to discuss. Actually, we don't have data about, uh, about this because we should uh, uh, set up an experimental design that would be very, very complicated. Uh, but uh, I, I think that it it can be this can be like an uh, hypothesis to 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 say that uh, you should use poles because you save uh, your legs and then you can run faster in the in the other section of the race. Yeah, I, I think that the, that is re it's speculation as you mentioned. Yeah, but I think that that's reasonable speculation based on some of the a lot of the work that you've done and also just how athletes why athletes use poles in longer races even though they might not be particularly steep as you mentioned yeah. earlier right we know when it's very steep you do get you know performance advantage and the intensity is higher you do get a performance advantage but despite just knowing that we still see athletes use poles in the tour de jant right you know, yeah. 330 K super steep terrain, very low intensity because of the, uh, the duration of the event. And, 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 and if you talk to those athletes, a lot of, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the dialogue is going to be just centered around. I'm trying to quote unquote, save my legs. We're going to leave it at that, man. Thanks for, uh, coming back on the podcast. Maybe we'll bring you back yeah. on once this next paper is coming out. Yeah. Because I, I do, I do think it's super interesting now that we have, uh, a lot of the instrumentation to start to um, yeah. uh, to start to look at other reasons. So I'll probably cajole you into into coming back on on the podcast at that point. But thank you, ma'am. And where can listeners uh, find more about you and the research that you do and the work that you're uh, performing? Um, yeah. First of all, thanks for the invitation, and uh, uh, it's nice to to present our works and uh, to discuss with you about this this data um, you can you can find uh, um, papers and other information on my website uh, nicolajovanelli.com and uh, on my uh, social page in, on facebook and and instagram uh, or if even anyone uh, wants to contact me uh, can do it um, uh, from this uh, uh, channel or by email from the website so yeah it's my pleasure well, keep doing the work that you're doing, man. We're solving really cool problems. I, I appreciate it. I'll have links to the show notes into all of that. And uh, I'm sure we're going to run each, into each other on the trail soon. Yeah.
Thank you. All right, folks, there you have it. There you go. Much thanks to Nicola for coming on the podcast today and discussing where we might actually get an advantage with the use of poles in trail running and in particular steep trail running. I do think that we have a lot to explore in this area, as we alluded to in the kind of towards the end of the podcast, because the research to date has only illuminated so much of the use case with poles. So we're going to continue to push the boundaries. We're going to continue to listen to athletes out in the field, and we're going to continue to examine under what conditions poles can be used and where some conditions, maybe they aren't quite so useful. And we have Nicola to thank for pushing the envelope in that particular area. We discuss both of the papers that Nicola and I discussed during the podcast in one of the future editions of my new research newsletter, Research Essentials for Ultra Running. We break it down amongst our research team. We dive into the detail, we dive into the nuance, and we come together with some conclusions that we didn't quite explore in this podcast. And we go into depth a little bit more than we can with this particular podcast. And I'm quite excited about what the results of that actually are. You guys can look forward to that in a future in a future edition, a future issue. It's probably going to come out maybe within the next two months. So you might have to uh, hold on for a second. If you are interested in signing up for that newsletter, it is only $9.99 a month. You can cancel anytime. And we examine three to five research papers that are specific to our ultra marathon with our PhD level team. We break it down into plain English and what the practical takeaways are for you, the athletes. You can sign up uh, directly on my website, which is jasoncoop.com. I will leave a link to that in the show notes. Appreciate the heck out of each and every one of the listeners out there. And as always, we will see you out on the trails.